All right, so today we're going to be talking about the perceptive musician, what that means. I forgot to record this part of the lesson when we were doing this with the other people, but you will see them shortly. We'll have the rest of our participants in, but I do want to give a little bit of a background of what this program is all about. So I thought about this program when I was thinking about ways that we could analyze music. Uh, we often focus on what you hear in music theory classes, which is what we call structural coherency, or at least that's what I call it. It's this idea that music has meaning because it has structure. And when we are looking at music, especially many of the textbooks today, we focus more on what the overall piece is about rather than chord by chord. But there's a lot of other ways we can find meaning in music or try to understand more about it uh, that especially have a great intersection with psychology. For example, perception and phenomenology, which is what we'll talk about today. Uh, the way that we experience music is extremely important to what we do. In fact, I'd say it is essential to everything that we do. Uh, along with that, there's memory, time, and how things transform over time. Uh, I call that flow, and I believe that's also something essential to see in music and has a lot of answers through the way that we talk about music in the mind, the way that music psychology might be happening while we're doing things. Musicology, a different type of approach to understanding music can go into culture, social identity, historical context. Many people like to talk about the way that a composer's fingerprint is in the piece or how the composer thought about writing it, the intent of the composer. That's a very popular way for people to look into music. There's also this idea of innovation that somebody did something new, right? When we talk about music history, that's what we're talking about is somebody did something cool. They were the person who paved the way for that movement to happen or for that idea to catch hold and create a class of musicians that do the same thing. And this is in all of these things can happen in popular or they can happen in uh, classical music and any type of music, you'll have all of these things and then the last one on here is embodiment and semiotics, which is something I'll be talking about in the second month of this program. So the reason I like to think about all of these different per, um, dimensions of music, all these different perspectives, is because I think that each of these viewpoints clarifies something about the music the others cannot grasp. And I learned this idea from a psychology class that I took a long time ago in my undergraduate. And we looked at psychology from seven different perspectives. The evolutionary perspective was one of those. The developmental perspective was another. Each of these perspectives gave us a different idea of something that is very useful and helps us understand the human mind and, of course, just the human psyche, generally speaking. And they were also in possible to like uh, explain some other phenomena that were happening that were better explained by another one, right? So all these kind of come together to tell us a fuller picture of what is going on, right? So music theory talks about structural coherency a lot. Uh, in fact, I've kind of narrowed it down to that most music theory papers are about structure and flow. Really, that's about it um, with a lot of focus on maybe the surprising aspects of those two. Musicology is very much focused on culture, identity, historical context, the composer's fingerprint, all of the details that surround the music. And these are also very helpful, but we often ignore, except on the research level, or if you're going to de some deep articles in music theory or musicology or so forth, the part of psychology, you know, that's not taught in a typical curriculum. But think about it, isn't that, a big part of what we do, isn't it? Isn't music about the experience? So that's why I think it's important to approach music from several places rather than one, because I think we're missing the picture sometimes when we omit these things. So the goals I have for this class, the Perceptive Musician, is to help uh, our participants to help all of us um, perceive musical patterns, structure, colors, flow better in the music. 
to learn how to identify and talk about musical elements that are coming together to make the music speak rather than think about them as just harmony like we do a lot of the time in our theory classes. Um, to also understand some of the cognitive and phenomenological principles that we'll talk about that more that explains how music makes sense to the brain. And then the last part of this third month of this class is going to talk about the acoustical properties of the voice and instruments that allow us to have the variety of timbres that we have and also allow us to have the very practical uh, ideas about instrumentation and how those things can come together. I can write for any instrument. And here I'm going to cut over to the rest of the video with our participants. Thanks. For that. So basically we have the three months. Um, this first month is about active listening and phenomenology. This is the first lesson of that. Uh, the next month is about embodied cognition. So it's all about how does our bodily experience in life relate to music and a lot of the things that some people have been saying about that and how that could relate to the way we perform and write music. Um, and the final part again is about acoustics and instrumentation. Uh, each of these modules are self-contained, so you don't have to like go through all three of them uh, to get something out of it. Each one is independent of the other. You can do number two without number one, number three without number two, and so forth. And then there's tuition that you see right there, uh, trying to keep it as affordable as possible. This is kind of half of this is kind of an experiment on my end of seeing, you know, where the interest lies. And um, it's also a great way to pay off a lot of college debt, right? So um, every really lesson for this, and I'll, I'll send a review sheet for you this week too. It'll come with a recording, a review sheet, um, and I'll retype out so many tangents we might get to. And then we'll also have the opportunity. I have assignments in here. You can share your work with other people if you want to do those or just if you want to share some other work that you're doing. All right, but I think this is probably who we have. So let's kind of go quickly and introduce each other uh, ourselves. So I'm Dylan. Uh, I think most of you, all of you know me personally, but I'm a composer. I just graduated in 2020 from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I was teaching adjuncts here in music theory for a year, and now I'm going up to University of Wisconsin La Crosse it's right on the border of Wisconsin and Minnesota, and I'll be teaching music there, uh, specifically music theory appreciation, but also making a new music festival and doing some composition course in the winter. So I'm excited to take a step forward in this crazy climate. Um, so I'll say who's in my order. I see Sarka next. Hi, so yeah, my name is Sharka Stahirova, and congratulations to Dylan <laughs> on moving to uh, another uh, job. That's great. <laughs> uh, I am in my second year of my DMA at uh, University of Nebraska uh, in Lincoln, and I study uh, piano performance with Dr. Mark Clinton. Thanks. Nice to meet you. <laughs> All right, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Very excited about all the things you're doing. That's fantastic. So I am on faculty at Samford University here in Birmingham, Alabama, where I teach music theory and composition. Uh, I did the Master of Music Composition, Master of Music Theory, and Doctor of Musical Arts Composition at the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore. All right, thanks so much. Esther. So I'm probably the odd one out around here. Um, I, I am actually doing a PhD in instructional design. So I'm on the education side, I like music. I like um, to sing, um, not like professionally any sort of musician, but um, I worked with Dylan on a, a video project for something that he had composed and just sort of interested to see what he what he's up to and I mean I love music and so thinking about the experience of music and uh, how to impact that uh, and I, uh, just uh, interested to see uh, what you guys say. Great 
Thanks. And uh, yeah, so the video project she mentioned, that was my dissertation project and she directed it. It's over 50 minutes long. So she gets a lot of props for doing that video direction because that was a gigantic project we floated on her. So Esther is awesome. All right, Regina. Hello, my name is Regina and I'm a pianist. I actually just graduated with my DMA in piano performance and yeah I knew Dylan we went to school together and he wrote a piece for me and I premiered it like a few years ago and yeah I'm very interested in teaching about music also so this is like something that I'm very interested in to listen to like the perspective of the music instead of thinking of it in like theory, it's more about how we feel it. So thanks, Stephen, for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Regina. And uh, Colin. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Colin. I am a mining geologist, <laughs> um, but I enjoy music as well. I play the Scottish bagpipes, and I also play traditional Irish music. Um, and I dabble in composing as well, although I don't have any uh, formal training in composing. Um, and so I feel like this is really interesting to me. I, list, I enjoy music both as a, a listener and a performer and a composer, and I want to learn more. Thanks. And he's actually been through a few of these classes when we were doing it over the mm -hmm. winter, so. Uh, yeah, they're great. In the mode for that. Awesome. And Jordan. Hello, I'm Jordan. I just jumped on. Um, I went to school with Dylan um, during undergrad. I played the oboe. And now I um, just graduated from medical school. So I'll be starting an internal medicine residency soon. So I'm still interested in um, music and I enjoy talking to Dylan when we were in school together. So I thought I'd jump on his, uh, this meeting real quick. <laughs> awesome, thanks. We actually roomed together on a tour of the Wind Symphony in Mongolia. So we got to try camel's yogurt together. It's disgusting, don't ever do it. So, all right, glad everyone's here. And there's this Roger person coming in and out. We'll find out if we get to introduce him or not. <laughs> Um, hopefully he's able to get connection to stay in. All right, so uh, let's jump in. Today we're going to be focusing on this idea of phenomenology. It's a big word. Uh, it's fun to say. Pretty simple meaning. But the word ology, of course, means it's the study of something, right? So it's the study of happenings as we perceive or experience them. So the big question that we have today is how do we process in our music, in our brains, uh, and experience music? And this is going to be based on not notes, but it's based on, you know, how we're getting it in our ears. Uh, in the fullest sense of phenomenology, this could go beyond just what we hear. This could be how do you, you know, the visuals when we see a band playing live or when we see a performer playing live on stage, how does that affect the way that we experience the music? So there's a lot of ways you could look at this. Today, we're going to be focusing just on the aural aspect of that. So. How do we process and experience music in the aural sense with our ears? Uh, and this is a kind of straightforward way to look at music, but we don't really talk about it. I mean, I hadn't heard about the word until I started doing my own research. Um, but if music's like an experiential art form, it makes complete sense that we would study it from the way that we experience it, right? So, um, the way to approach music phenomenologically is to listen and try to learn how to explain it. So as we're listening first, which is what we'll be doing a little bit today is we'll be doing some listening of quite a few uh, bits and pieces of music. Uh, the opportunity that we have is to let our ear guide everything that's happening rather than what we usually do. We, rather, like, we usually come in with a jet focus on something. We want to know more if we wanna understand music better. We wanna look into the harmony. Usually is where a lot of people go. You go into the harmony, maybe go into how the rhythm is working. 
but I think the best way to really enter into a piece phenomenologically is to actually let the experience happen to you. And then after you have that experience to take a step back and start talking about what are the things that you're hearing and start to bring together all the bits and pieces. Again, we're very good at taking parts and talking about the parts, but it's very hard for us to talk about the whole, how things come together. And the great thing about this group is we have a very uh, diverse group of people in terms of background and what they have interest in. So it's gonna be great to hear from everybody's perspectives here. And as we do these things, I think we start to expand the oral possibilities that we understand are part of the sonic experience. So we're gonna actually start with uh, a song that I found really interesting at the starting of last year. Uh, and it's from the Gorillas is Desole. And we're gonna listen to about a minute of it to the introduction. And the questions we have are the very basic ones, right? So what drew you into the music? What kept you listening? And then was there anything that catches your attention that made something change in the music, right? So what was the attention grabber? What kept you there? And then what were things that uh, initiated change or helped the music keep going? So here we go. This is Desolé. All right, so we're gonna actually have an open discussion on this. Uh, you can raise your hand if that, that might be the easiest way to not talk over each other. So if anyone has a comment, you can raise your hand and we can talk about again. So what drew you in? What kept you listening? And what were some things that initiated change? Go call him. Uh, so I thought it was kind of interesting um, how they simple drum beat and they layered in guitar, then they had a bass line and vocals. Um, and then of course the, the synth towards the end of the section there as well. Um, <laughs> it was kind of a parallel to me to Irish music where often you'll have you know one musician, you'll start with the fiddle and then the the pipes and the whistles and and uh, whatever else the drums will join later on kind of layered in as you go throughout repetitions of the tune um and so you know when you just hear the same thing every time uh, for me at least every time something changes the music it, there's just a little bit of a spark of attention and so if you just put in you just layer each um additional layer of the music on top of each other that keeps your brain oh what's this now oh what's this oh what's this Something's different, and the synths contrasted uh, with um, what we've been hearing before, which is just more traditional, just vocals, uh, guitar, bass, and drums. Yeah, for sure, great, awesome. So we're talking about orchestration, right? Talking about who's coming in, who's playing what, um, the roles that they start to assume. Good. Um, does anyone want to comment further on the orchestration? or tone color, there's other ways you can go about it as well. 
Hello, Mark. Yeah, I was changing up my audio. Do I still have a mic? You're on. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate what Colin said. Uh, this, some of the same things kind of drew me in, and part of what drew me in about it, I think, was the was the sense of of sonic uh, depth, the sort of three dimensional quality of it, that it established the sound of the drums, and then when the guitar came in, it was kind of in its own sonic space and then the voice and so on. Awesome, great, thanks. Other comments that you had, things that you heard in the music? Go for it, Esther. Less the music itself, though, like it's just the words that went with it. Um, for me, it was a contrast of language, um, hearing things in English with, I don't actually know if that is French or um, yes, French. Know, is, but um, the, that's what I, that's what I know. So that's sort of what spoke to me, at least in terms of like interest and in trying to understand what they were trying to express. Yeah, for sure. I think it's very often when we go into it thinking like it's gonna be a musical experience, again, taking the complete picture. And so what does the text mean? And this text isn't like telling you, this is not, this is a story of a girl, you know, that song tells you exactly what it's about, right? <laughs> this song just gives you a uh, one word in a language you don't know. And then the entire time you're listening to the song, you're trying to figure out what it means, you know? You know, desolate sounds like the word desolate. So maybe you're kind of pulling some clues that way, but you don't know. Uh, unless you know French. So that's actually a really important part of it, right? So it's not just about the telling the story, but the words actually giving some questions and providing a place that we can navigate into what the music actually could be about. Great. Other thoughts? So something that uh, Mark was saying about this multidimensionality, right? It feels like a very three-dimensional piece. Uh, there's some things that uh, I hear that are really interesting to me that come out of, for example, when he says desolate, there's a lot of what we would call reverb on that. And what it does is it kind of goes to the background, but it doesn't go away completely. If you listen to it carefully, you start to hear that this three dimensionality comes from there's always these drones in the background and they're constantly oscillating. They're not really ever uh, static. They're usually unpredictable the way that they go in and out. And having that background level, that background uh, layer, it allows us to kind of go deeper into the music if we want to and listen to the subtleties that are happening. So if I hear this the 30th time, which I've probably listened to it more than 30 times because I like it. Um, then I start to hear these things. I start to hear these background elements. So the cool thing about it is that in the first listen, you have this idea of orchestration that is very immediate. You might hear register as something very immediate. Uh, as you listen to it more and more, you start to hear that there is this richness that you get, this three-dimensionality uh, that, again, there's this idea of the drones, but there's also how the layers are interacting with each other. Um, there's a lot of depth in what we have, and that full-on experience is cool because every time we listen to it, it's going to be something different, something else going to catch our attention. And that's, you know, something we get to love about music, and that's what makes this so hard when we want to analyze it, per se, right, and understand the music is because every time we experience it, it's going to be a different experience. If you hear that for the first time, it's very different than if you hear it for a much later time, right? So cool. Thanks for your participation. And I listed a whole slew of traditional musical qualities, I'm going to call them. Traditional because I think at some point, someone somewhere tried to notate these in music. So you should probably recognize most of these, but are there any questions on any of these terms, what they might mean? I think usually the one people who are not doing music major especially might be texture, but that's going to be how like multiple voices are interacting 
Um, the art of doing that is usually called counterpoint, but texture can be something different than that as well. But it's kind of the composite of everybody playing together. What does that sound like? Uh, and we have labels for that as well, but cool. So these are the traditional musical qualities. Um, now there's additional musical qualities that are equally there for us to pay attention to. And again, the reason why I'm showing you all of these is because there's so many ways you can enter into the music that are part of the musical experience. And if we know how to talk about them, then that's the first step that we have towards analyzing, really understanding what's going on and seeing how those things could apply to how we create music, whether that be creating it by composing or interpreting it or improvising it. So if we think about it, we can be noisy with our instruments. We can be very, very pure uh, or we can be very noisy. In some cultures, we have, for example, the marimba. The marimba in the United States has to be as pure as possible. Uh, even when you're bowing it, it starts to sound kind of like a clarinet. It's not even the most, you know, the noisiest thing in the world. It's a little bit noisy, but um, it blends really well with the clarinet. But if you go to Guatemala, then the marimba is extremely noisy and they love it. That's why they do it. They do it on purpose. It's not because they're bad at crafting them because they've been, you know, they have a great tradition of marimba. They just like the noise. And of course we love the noise in guitar, right? Thanks to the uh, people in the 1950s and 60s, right? Chuck Berry and friends. Um, then we also have spatialization, panning, you could say on your headphones, but if you're in a live concert, you know, where is the sound coming from and how does that affect the musical piece that we're listening to? Semantics, like Esther brought up, words in the relationship to music, that is something very important. Pitch nuance, this is something in popular music that's so essential to it. How do we get into a pitch? How do we get out of a pitch? What do we do when we're on the pitch, right? Um, it's hard to think about doing that, you know, sometimes in the piano, so composers have to do things to get there. Uh, I was watching a video by Stevie Wonder, for example, where he was saying, well, I'm trying to imitate a trumpet and that's why I'm doing all these grace notes. Uh, or he's trying to imitate, you know, Ella Fitzgerald or something is in his mind. He was saying these different people that he's trying to do and he's showing it on the piano. He's showing how he translated the pitch nuance, the little subtleties of how someone sings or plays an instrument into a piano that doesn't get you those, you know, uh, different coming in, coming out of pitches that you can get in other places without it being notated as such. Um, composers are very popular, uh, are, it's very popular among composers to think about gesture. So sound or a group of notes, however you want to think about it, is about a directed action. So rather than be just a large group of 30 second notes, for example, very fast notes, well, it's just a whoosh upward that's really what it's about. Uh, and that's something that's really popular again. Um, then there's, of course, extra musical quotations, uh, you know, referring to a different style that happens in classical music all the time. It's also essential to hip hop, right? It's always sampling, and there's a big tradition of that. And then style is a combination of all of these things together. Um, which is what my lesson prepared for next week is about, is about how to style, how do these things come together to create a sense of style and character. So I was going to pull out the most immediate ideas for today, which are orchestration and register. So orchestration simply is how instruments and voices enter and leave music, and maybe also what they sound like, right, what their tone color is. And then register, how high or how low an instrument or voice is playing. So both of these come together. These are the most immediate things that we hear usually. Um, so basically, we know when instruments are playing. We hear when they come in. We hear when they leave. We hear how about how high they are, how low they are. Um, it's hard to get simpler than orchestration of register when we talk about what music is in this experience. So. If you're struggling as you're listening to something, just remember orchestration register, who's playing, who's not playing, what register they are in. Those are great entry points into having a uh, something to talk about when we talk about these experiences. So 
And oh yeah, are there any questions at that from everything we just talked about? All right. So of course this is great for a listener to think about everything we just talked about. But the real question is, can we actually control the way that someone else experiences music? Is there something that we can do to help that happen? Um, someone like John Cage might be like, I don't know if I want that to happen, right? Um, he says, and that's a big part of one of my thoughts of how I got into this as well is John Cage, who's the person who wrote the four minutes of 33 seconds in silence. He said that, you know, the musical experience is on the, per on the person listening. It's not on the performer. Um, in fact, he didn't really want to have any fingerprint at all in everything he did. Ironically, everyone knows John Cage when they hear it. So he has a gigantic fingerprint, but he tried to get away from that. And he tried to say, ultimately, it's the person listening who's having the experience. Uh, and they're the ones who control how that experience is going to happen. And that's true to an extent, right? I mean, we've had time when music is playing, for example, you're shopping at the mall, you're not really experiencing the music in a fully attentive way as if you're in the live concert. So he's right in a big way. The way that we are experiencing the music is going to be different depending on everything. The mood that we're in, how sleepy we are, where we're at, how we're listening to it. Um, but as a composer performer, we want to be able to somehow probably do something to pull them out of that. Um, bring them into our world, right? So that's the big question of today. So we're going to do rapid fire listening. So we're going to have three musical pieces just for 30 seconds. And I want you to write down what caught your attention, two to three words. You can do it on a piece of paper, but in the end, I'm actually going to ask you to throw them all in the chat. So if you want to type them right into the chat and send them out when you're done, then you can do that. Um, and then after we talk about them, we'll, uh, or after we have all the examples, we'll reveal our answers. So the thing is, don't let another person in the chat ruin what you say. So um, here we go. This is going to be number one. You might know these, you might not know these. So here we go. Two to three words, however they are, however goofy they feel, however boring you feel like they feel, but just two descriptive adjective emotive words. All right, that's number one. You can throw your answers in the chat if you have them ready. Give you a moment to do that. All right, good. Let's go to the next one, and then we'll talk about it later. Here's number two. All right, 
give you a moment to type, uh, respond to that one. Two to three words, descriptive. All right, good. Sorry, I just like the pile of snakes comment. That's a good one. All right, here we go. Let's do, uh, this is the last one we'll do. Here's number three. All right, comments for number three. I think that's most of us. Okay, awesome. All right, let's talk about it. So number one, going back to the first one, we have, um, that's Childish Gambino, and it feels like summer. So we have uneasy starting rhythm, skipping a beat, chill dance, rhythmic, interestingly relaxed, and the vocals came on, light surface percussion, friendly voice. Um, good. So yeah <clears throat> the starting of it is interesting right we have this really interesting rhythm that's happening that pulsing and yeah the voice in, comes in very relaxed i think it comes in harmonically a little bit that way too on how it goes on top of that bass um are there any other comments that you have maybe that you didn't feel like you could capture in those two to three words on that one The beat sort of felt organic to me, like not quite like a heartbeat, but like um, I, I got a very like physical sense of the beat, like you're walking or you're like, you know, hitting or stamping or something. Yeah. Well, the music video is him walking pretty much the entire time, so. <laughs> <laughs> person who made the video thought that too that that is the one with like the the crazy the background is that uh I, oh the music video is him walking around a neighborhood okay maybe. so yeah um yeah this isn't the controversial one that was from a few few years ago um yeah so and this one's actually about global warming um interestingly enough so it has this kind of idea of humanity that kind of gets put against problems which is the interesting thing i think well i did this same piece last time i taught this lesson and some people felt the bass is kind of ominous when it comes in because you have something that's pretty chill and that bass is a kind of harder bass um so some people kind of interpreted that as something that might have to do with that. I'm not, I'm not sure if they'd heard the piece before, though, and 
interpret it based on that experience, right? So it's interesting to try to get these things down to two or three words, though, because when we do that, then um, it forces us to describe things in an interesting way. And I think something interesting that we get that I think is equally interesting and crucial to it. Uh, we can talk about rhythm and beats and things like that, but even something like, you know, Regina said chill dance, I think that kind of gives me an image of what this is, right? So, but we definitely agree all that it's a very rhythmic, maybe groove oriented piece that has some kind of relaxation to it. All right, the second one, um, this is Ornette Coleman. So this is Ornette Coleman from his album, um, it just blanked my mind, Free Jazz. Uh, that should not have blanked my mind. <laughs> yeah, so this is a pretty seminal album because, you know, it's really when he jumped into this idea of free jazz. So we have on that one, dissonant intervals, annoying crowd, dissonant speed pitches, semi-organized chaos, varying density, controlled wildness. So we definitely got the idea, the image of chaotic, right? Um, nearly everybody had this idea of this chaotic, intense, maybe dissonant thing happening, right? Um, so again, what we're talking about is how do we catch someone's attention? Well, this is uh, obviously something that caught everyone's attention. It was very easy for them to identify what's happening immediately. Knowing this is all completely in improvised, it makes it, it makes sense that there is a lot of this chaos happening, right? And as you listen to it, as it keeps on going, there is always going to be that wildness to it, but it is controlled. They are listening to each other and you'll start to hear some call and response and other things that happen throughout the uh, entire album, which is just nonstop improvising for like 40 minutes. So. Cool. And then the last one was um, the Prokofiev Symphony. I think a lot of you might know that if you're in classical world already, but that's Prokofiev's first symphony, the classical symphony. Um, so yeah, steady, organized, snobby vibe, intrigue, dynamics, light and active. And this is an interesting one because um, I feel like our interpretations of what a classical sound is, is coming out right now. I feel like we've all had our own perceptions of what that sound, that archetypal sound is and we're basically re revealing them right here on the paper, um, <laughs> which is really interesting. So yeah, so I'd actually love to ask a little bit more. So Mark, what do you mean by intrigue? Yeah, so I, it was just kind of an emotional response, just kind of a, a, a feeling listening to this again. Uh, I don't know if it's the, the surprising to get a little technical, the surprising tonal relationships, where there'll be a sudden jump to a different key, uh, if if it's that or or what exactly, but something something kind of drew me in that was just a feeling of, oh, there's something uh, tricky, something tricky going on. Yeah, I, I feel that too, and I think that kind of goes with along with like what Esther is saying about light and active in a sense as well, right? Like it just kind of hops to really, you know, unpredictable places. There's these big bangs that uh, Colin got with the dynamics, right? Um, you know, there's some really interesting things that happen in this piece. I love this piece, it's it's fun. And I think it is a witty piece. It, I don't think you can take it seriously, which is maybe why it has that snobby sound to it perhaps, you know, I mean, you take it seriously in one sense, but at the same time, you know, there's some kind of humor that's happening underneath, at least for me. That's how I'm interpreting. That's how I perceive it. In fact, I'd love to hear from Regina. Tell me about the snobby vibe. Well, I just feel like um, anything that's, you know, especially after listening to the first and the second, I think then we get to more classical piece. And as a classical musician, it's like I'm listening to all like, the texture, all the dynamics, it's kind of like flashback to the exams and stuff like that. And it just makes me feel like, oh, it has a more snobby feeling to it. Yeah, it's hard to get away from the, the 
image of wigs sometimes. The French wigs and all that fancy clothing. Um, which brings me to Fluffy. Tell me about Fluffy, Jordan. Well, I, well, that's what I just, I was picturing like clouds as it was going on. And, and um, then there was those sudden dynamic changes, which didn't fit with the cloud image in my mind. And I was trying to like figure out what that was, but it wasn't like, I don't think it was like lightning or thunder. It was more like, uh, I don't know what it was, but I don't know. It just sounded um, more ordered and not as serious or maybe not serious. I don't know. It's hard, hard to put into words, but like maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. No, that's good. No, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this kind of idea, this image, this story that kind of comes to your mind is just as um, valid in a lot of ways. And I think it helps open up, you know, greater ways to understand music is the images that come to mind as we hear something. So no, it's good. Thanks for sharing. I mean, yeah. Like, you know, right here, I wrote magical feeling. Uh, and that's, that's a legitimate one too, right? So good. All right. So talking about some of the mechanics that come out of this idea, right? So these ones, I think caught our attention in different ways, perhaps. I think all of them did catch your attention, correct? Was there any of them that, you know, you're just like, eh? So, you know, they all, they all use very different ways to catch your attention, but they did something that was able to do that. Um, whether it was isolating one thing, like the pulls at the starting of the Childish Gambino one, or hitting you in the face with a whole bunch of instruments, like the Ornette Coleman one, or this one, um, the Prokofiev with the big bang and then, you know, something really soft after it, right? There's a lot of things that happen immediately to get our attention. But the trick is, uh, first off, we only pay attention to one thing at once. I think you've heard that in all sorts of settings. Um, the important part about that is that we're really good at alternating about what grabs our attention. So when we listen to these, uh, and maybe look back at them now that we're done listening to them. So what, what demanded your focus? Um, I guess we kind of talked about that in a lot of ways. Never mind. Uh, sorry, I revealed the answer um, from what I had. But what were other things that demanded your focus in those last excerpts? Maybe things I didn't say. Sorry for talking too much. <laughs> Go for it, Mark. Yeah, I actually have a question about this uh, in a way. As I listened to the Childish Gambino recording, the, the, I said surface percussion, but what I was really hearing was there's this sort of synth piano thing, and it sounds like there's layered with that sound, a percussive sound, so that every time there's a note on the keyboard, we get that sort of smooth synth piano sound, but the attack is this really uh, pretty present woody kind of a, a smack on every note. And that's that's getting pretty technical. Is that is that out of bounds for this kind of phenomenological thinking to get really technical? Because that's that's that you know my my thinking about this music is informed by my experience and different ways of listening. No, I don't think that you have to turn off your technical brain at all. I think if that's what pulled you in, then that's a whole world that's great. And actually, you know, now that you say that, I think that that's one that pulls you in through subtlety. The other two kind of pull you in at the bang. Um, and I think it's totally fine. In fact, uh, I learned, I'll have to go back and remember who it was, but there's kind of two ways that we listen to music. And it's actually based on the envelope. ADSR. Um, so when we, we, we're sometimes very focused on the attack, in other words, the excitement, the drama, the things that are happening that are being thrown at us. Um, that's one way that we listen to music. The other way is the sustain part. Um, so these are going to be the subtleties that happen, the things that have to do with the tone color, um, things that have to do with the continuation of an idea. 
rather than, you know, just new information constantly. So I think as composers and performers and others like listeners, uh, we, we kind of fall on a different level. And this is actually a little bit later in the slides. Um, I think we have a threshold of accessibility that we develop over time that the more we listen to music, there's kind of a higher threshold of this accessibility, what's accessible to us, what we're going to have a musical experience with. But yeah, I mean, I actually love what you're talking about. Now that I look back at it, I think that's such a cool combination of timbres that make that really pop. So does that answer the question? Uh, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, so it's so it's a very subjective way of listening, but it's but it's subjective and personal, and it's and it's in each of, for each of us, it's going to be informed by different experiences. Yeah, for sure. There's no objective way, and this is why it's hard to teach in a classroom setting. Obviously, you can't give an exam and say that. Did you hear that? No, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it's a very experiential way. But I do think, of course, this does inform us. The more that we learn how to identify these things and discuss them the greater opportunities we have as musicians to use these things, right? It's a very practical thing, but very personal as well. So great. And yeah, and you described it in a way that's interesting to me. You know, you brought an insight to me that was helpful to me um, in understanding music better, maybe learning how to steal. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no problem. No, don't want to be cool if you had like a whole lesson where you talked about attack and sustain and release. I know, never done that before, Colin. Yeah, yeah. Okay, think think about it. All right, we did that. Uh, it's part of these lessons. <laughs> He's done that lesson before. <laughs> yeah, so it's a great, it's a great thing. Um, so, let's see. Let's talk about so the idea, some basic things, very practical, um, things that if you're a composer, your teacher has probably told you a hundred times. Um, less is more. And I think this is a good thing maybe for everybody because the idea sometimes is that we're really focused on the technique about maybe our virtuosity and things like that. Um, and of course, some pieces will have to start out with something really flashy, but really the impact that you get, for example, from the Ornette Coleman isn't going to be necessarily all of the notes that they played, but it's really just the virtuosity of them playing really quickly. Maybe the chaotic is the, it's the feeling that really gets us when we, the reason we're able to kind of narrow these things down to just a few words is because it kind of gives us an image. And I saw you with Chen Yi, she's a wonderful composer and great teacher. And she always was like, you need to capture the image, you know, immediately the person needs to have an image because that image is really what brings us into the piece. You know, it gives us kind of an idea musically of what's going to be, uh, what this piece is all about. A, a piece that doesn't really have an image at the start is something that's really hard for us to deal with a lot of the time. Um, it puts a bad taste in our mouth if we really can't trace anything in the music. Um, so really one distinctive feature, and it could be subjective, it's something that just interests us. There has to be enough there at the starting to interest us, but there has to be a focus to it. And this focus comes a lot of the time from repetition. Repetition confirms importance and builds expectation. So if I am a performer and I know that this kind of repeated melody, um, I know what to do to make this interesting by changing it up, but I also get the opportunity to use my, uh, the way that I phrase this the first and the second time, the third time to confirm its importance and build that expectation. Uh, that's something I can do to interpret this musically. And a composer, of course, is going to hopefully repeat things once in a while. So this idea of we create an image, we have a really big focus at the starting, something that really draws us in. But then we have to remember this idea right here. Um, and since I talk way too much, I'm going to ask for someone else to uh, read this. Who would love to read this? Uh, and I am not scared to call. Oh, all right, go Colin. Jordan, you're off the hook. I was going to call on you. Okay. Our ability to stay focused on a particular task is limited, resulting in well-known performance decrements with increasing time on task. Intriguingly, such decrements are even more likely if the task is cognitively simple and repetitive. 
All right, so interpret this into modern English, street vernacular English. Um, it, it's interesting because, okay, so um, the other day, one such example at, at work is I was using my highly specialized uh, master's degree geologist skills to write sample numbers on bags. And we had uh, 50 samples and I just had to write them in increasing order, just one sample number further on bags so we could put samples into them and send them off to lab for analysis. And I, I messed up. I, I miswrote out the numbers and it's literally as simple as writing the sample on a bag, next bag, writing a sample, next bag, um, and it's an inc cognitively simple and repetitive task. And yet, you know, my performance decrease um, resulted in, in an error that had I not connected, uh, had I not realized this error and corrected it, it could have caused problems down the road. And so, you know, the same thing in, in music as well, um, that, you, you know, something, I think maybe something repetitive catches my interest at first. Um, but if that's all it is, it's like, mm, okay, I've heard enough of this next song on the playlist. Um, but if there's just enough of a tweak, you know, as the music goes along, it's like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh hey, okay, now this is kind of cool too. What, what's coming next? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and thanks for applying it to the music. Uh, are there other comments on this? Um, so kind of, I guess this jumps right into those questions, right? So how will the listener keep listening and how much influence do you as a musician have in keeping the listeners there? Or maybe even a better question is, what do you do to do this in your music, right? When you're playing a piece of music, when you interpret it, what are some of the things that you think about in terms of this? Um, like the way that you phrase things, the way that you express the music or the way you compose music, what are the things that you're doing? What is on your mind constantly that has to do with this topic? Or maybe this is a revelation. You're like, oh, uh, this is something I wanna think about a lot more. But what are your thoughts on this? So I was thinking about this for a long time uh, because, you know, I am a pianist, so I play just piano music for like an hour and that's very tiring for listeners. So um, I came up with that. I try to introduce the piece before I play it so people hear a, like a different instrument, even though I'm just talking about the piece, but I mean, like uh, they hear voice instead of just the piano the whole 60 minutes. Or I was also thinking maybe to add something visual, but I, I don't know yet how to incorporate it to uh, solo piano music yet. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, those are great ideas. Uh, yeah, and I think the multimedia thing is still, I think that's a big thing that's going to be happening in the next bit. I think a lot of us are going to be using a lot more video. Uh, great. Yeah, I never thought about that. You know, you speaking really to be a different instrument as part of the entire concert. It's a great idea. Um, other thoughts? All right, so um, I know that for me when I compose that this is kind of something that's pretty much always on my mind. not like the listener keep on listening. I'm not trying to please an audience every single second of my piece. Um, what I'm thinking about though is how do I, what do I do to keep this to be something that's not too repetitive, but still has some coherency, right? We wanna have it still feel like it's a piece of music um, and that there's something that they can follow through, uh, have that image, but what can I do to, you know, change things up a little bit? And I thought we'd listen to a piece by our friend WC for this, but not by WC playing it, um, but we're going to listen to an orchestrated version of the Pacipede um, by the Punch Brothers. So we're going to listen to, for time's sake, probably 
mm, we might get through all of it, but I'm not sure. Um, and we'll start to talk about this. But the one thing I want to think about or bring to the table as well is this idea of maybe how elisions could be a part of this as well. So we've talked about orchestration, we talked about register, maybe a third thing to think about is maybe when do things start and when do things stop? And when do things feel like they're going to start or think they feel like they're going to stop, stop but then they continue. Um, that's gonna be the third layer of ideas of attention that I, I wanted to introduce. So here we go, this is the um, Punch Brothers and because I think there is this visual component that can be important to us. I'm actually going to share the video of it for you. So here we go. All right, so there's the questions there, but there's also maybe your other observations. So how did it keep your attention from beginning to end? What were some of the things that really, you know, drew you into the piece and kept you there?
If you want us to put stuff in the chat, are we talking? Oh, uh, you can talk. Yeah. I mean, I guess in the chat, if that's easier for everyone to put their thoughts into words that way, that's fine. I'll accept either. I really liked how they passed the focus from instrument to instrument. From it, again, visually, people stepping forward um, to like take attention some of the time. Yeah, so you had orchestration happen, but they also highlighted the orchestration by doing physical movement, right? And of course, there's camera angles helping us with that too, but they did literally step forward, um, which was you know, helpful for people who are in the audience to kind of know exactly who is playing, uh, especially if they don't know what the instruments sound like, you know, and it's their first concert of that variety. Great, other thoughts? especially from the pianists who know this piece already. I think um, one thing that stuck out to me was, so I guess when often I listen to music, I'll kind of, to, I don't know, tune out is the right word, term for it, but I, I focus on the more sustained, um, the more sustained melody. And so in this case, when we had the, I don't know if, so they looked like they had a mandolin. I'm not entirely sure all the orchestration of this uh, group, but they had a mandolin, they had a um, banjo, they had a couple others. And it was just the kind of just the light uh, plucking it. It almost was like a C just of a of background sound and then when they had the fiddle come in that's what my attention really focused on and it's almost like the fiddle was a boat carrying a melody on the sea and then when the fiddle stopped then i noticed that the sea of sound was there um uh, that i hadn't really been focused on before so i thought that was something that was kind of interesting yeah so the timbre of the fiddle is such a different timbre right and it also has the ability to sustain uh, none of the others, maybe the, the, the bass could sustain if they were using a bow, but aside from that, all the others have to pluck, and once the pluck is gone, it's gone, right? So that sustained melody that went through all that, that cut through, um, was able to carry the melody in a way that the others don't necessarily, which, you know, very much changes the perception of it, right? In the piano, you don't have that opportunity either. The piano doesn't have that sustain, so the fiddle is kind of the, the odd duck of the group, right? Um, but it's, yeah, it's one of those things that I think sticks out to me too in that rendition. So one more comment, if there is one. Go Sharka. I love that since I know the piano piece, right? So um, it was interesting how they picked like the instrumentation for each like motif like a melody uh that something there is something you cannot achieve with piano it's still gonna be the same color so uh, it was interesting how they picked like different instruments and uh suddenly when the violin played with the bow uh it had totally different feeling <laughs> it was great yeah, for sure. And I think something that comes out to me and maybe going along with these ideas of melody that I put questions about is the way that they orchestrate it really brings out the fact that WC never finishes a melody, but always brings it into a new melody. Um, they're always very similar, but he never really quite finishes. There's never really that many like moments of rest. It takes, if you're looking at the piano part, several pages, well, maybe like the second page, I think there's like the first moment of, and then you keep going in, you're, you're going for a long time, but he constantly is keeping us there. He never quite gives us a moment to really take a break. Uh, and that type of idea comes out in the orchestration by these fragments that all of these different instruments are playing. And I, I like that they were able to, the Punch Brothers were able to pull out that aspect of the music 
So as arrangers, they were able to take advantage of the way that WC created these phrases and these fragments and the incomplete nature of a lot of these melodies and make something new out of it that was fresh and I think still captures the essence of the piece, but also has its own interpretation take that is kind of delightful. So we, uh, I mentioned this earlier, this is kind of where we're going to finish off today. Um, I had one more activity planned, but it's all right. Sometimes better just to talk about principles and not worry about running and getting through the entire thing that was prepared. But this is the threshold of accessibility that I was talking about. So the question is, where is the line? So utter boredom is like completely predictable. Like it gets to this point where we just start to, you know, those concerts where you're with your friends and you just whisper to them like, I bet this is going to happen right now. You know, um, those kind of concerts are the ones we don't quite want to be at. Then there's some that are, you know, something that we like to tolerate. And these are, are very perceptive, right? Um, this is not anything set. This is just for personal, just us personally. You know, we can personally listen to something that's very basic to us. It's very predictable in the motion, but there's some kind of style to it. We like it. You know, that's something that is not boring to us, but maybe is pretty easy for us to listen to something that we're not going to be fully invested in necessarily. But as we add some more nuance to this, and again, this is all about perception, you know, this could be if we're on a bad day, something that could be this for us might end up being this for us because we're not there fully listening, right? Um, but on our, our best days, we probably end up wanting to be around here. Um, we want to have that nuance. You might even want some challenges in the way that we're listening to this. There's some more surprises. There's a stronger sense of style that really brings us into it. Um, sometimes this is getting a little bit too much for us, right? Because there's a lot of unpredictability. It's a little bit difficult to really get into the groove of what the piece is about. And then of course, on the full end of it, there's incomprehensibility, you know, there's complete chaos, randomness. I don't want to hear it turn off all this loud of guitars, right? Um, you know, all the complaints that you've heard about modern music over the years usually fall into this world of incomprehensibility or this idea of utter boredom, right? Um, in other styles too, right? I mean, some people say rap music ends up being this because of whatever. And then others would be like, well, if you listen to the lyrics, you might find yourself around here or if you, you know, decide to not profile it in a sense, right? So there's a lot of things that go into where this line is for us and everything that we do. Um, but one thing that is true among all of these is familiarity and experience with stylistic conventions increases accessibility and along with the piece itself, right? The more you know a style of music, the more accessible and easier to get into that it's going to be. So, for if you want to keep on doing the class or if you just want to do it for fun anyway, um, the assignment is a short attention grabbing exercise. And it doesn't say the word about music here. Um, so it can be something of however you want to do it, but it's recording a minute of the following. Um, so this is a kind of a composition of sorts. So the idea is to just grab attention, set the mood, create the image, make an interesting sound and figure out ways to continue it. And you're gonna maintain it with variation. Um, we didn't talk about that too much, but most of us kind of understand what variation is, right? So we could bring it over to other instruments. We could change the register. Um, we could do things like these elisions that WC was doing, um, things that offset the regularity of the music. When you're done, you can send it to me. You can send me a YouTube link as well. Um, I can put them in an unlisted playlist, share it with everybody here so that um, we can share each other's music. Um, if you have a musical piece that you've already written or something you've performed that you want to share as well, we could listen to that as well to kind of keep the conversation going. And if you're really interested long-term, you know, maybe I can make public playlists if we have enough people in this. So, um, Next week is about digging into style. So we'll start talking about meter, rhythm, articulation. Rhythm is there twice because it must be important, I guess. That was an accident. Um, and flow, which is, I think, the most important of those words right there, because that's really how we get into groove and character. So 
questions? Go for it. Yeah, so when do we uh, when do we discover the it that gives in the, the time and being of Heidegger? <laughs> That's where I thought this was going. When you said phenomenology and music, I thought this was going to be Husserl and Heidegger. And I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm taking a very <laughs> practical approach. Sorry. Um, I, yeah, I appreciate I should... that. No, yeah, I, I'm yeah. just, te I'm teasing you a little bit. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you've made this really practical and, and something that I think I can use in my teaching and my composing. So, no, I really appreciate the direction you've gone. I'm just teasing a little bit. Oh, Thank no, that's good. Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Uh, hmm, maybe next time. Heidegger. No. Uh, yeah, I remember reading a lot of that and it was kind of interesting. The funny thing is I actually came at it from the musical side of it first and then I went backwards to find out like where, where are these things that really coming from? So uh, yeah, I mean, it might be good to have a little bit of a theoretical foundation, but yeah, I'm just a very practical can, 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 can there be a little bit of Heidegger? I'm not sure there is such a thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, loaded. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Good. Other questions, comments? You can just go for it. If you have one. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to, uh, I'll stop the share or the, recording.